Daniel chapter number 9. We're picking it up where we left off. Well, we're going to go through the review. Got to have the review. If I didn't do a review, you would die of heart attack. You wouldn't know what happened. You'd think, who are you and what have you done with our pastor? Right? So we'll go through some review. But remember, there's always something new when we review. I always drop a little something new in there. And we'll be doing that today, I'm sure. Daniel chapter 9, we are looking at the prophecy of the 70 weeks. The prophecy of the 70 weeks begins at verse 24 and it runs through verse 27. Remember, this prophecy continues and elaborates on the prophecy Daniel received and recorded in Daniel chapter 8. So the prophecy of the 70 weeks is this. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Chapter 9, verse 24 of the book Daniel. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. His people would be the Jews, Israel. His city would be Jerusalem. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's the prophecy of 70 weeks. That's it. Typically, when we talk about the prophecy of the 70 weeks, we include verses 25 through 27, and, well, we should, (laughs) because it is part of the prophecy. However, it is important to understand the prophecy of the 70 weeks is verse 24. Verses 25 and following explain to us how that prophecy proceeds in its fulfillment. So the prophecy is, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, and these six things must take place within that 70-week period. Most people believe most of these were fulfilled on the cross when Jesus died on the cross. We'll be talking about that some more later. And there's a great deal of truth in that, certainly. We must remember, however, that these, the 70 weeks prophecy has to do with Israel. So we need to understand each of these six things as they relate specifically to Israel, or Israel. And uh, that's the little something new we just salted in there. We'll build on it later, okay? All right. The last thing in the list marks the conclusion of the prophecy. If you have 70 weeks to do these six things, then number six ends it. Or when all six things are done, it's over. The conclusion of the 70 weeks prophecy, therefore we conclude, is the anointing of the most holy. The language most holy is interesting in the text. There's quite a lot of controversy over it. If you read my text, you'll see in there I go into that whole issue and show how it resolves to this. The expression most holy can't refer to a thing, it must refer to a person for reasons that are detailed in my in my book and that we will go into later but essentially the bottom line is that expression as it's used in the Hebrew Bible it's virtually necessary to understand it as referring to a person and not to a thing and for that reason and some others many more as a matter of fact we conclude the anointing of the most holy is the anointing of Jesus Christ the Holy One of God who will be anointed king. And as the prophecy relates specifically to Israel, then the anointing of the Most Holy has to do with Israel receiving her Messiah and anointing him king. And that's what concludes the 70 weeks prophecy. The 70 weeks prophecy proceeds in fulfillment as follows. It begins at verse number 25. Know therefore and understand from the, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So what's that about? The street will be built and the wall in troublous times. And then verse 26, and after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Why doesn't it say after seven weeks and threescore and two weeks? Well, that's because the seven weeks are fulfilled. And then the 62 weeks begin fulfillment. And they continue on until we come to the last week mentioned in verse 27. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. When we get to that week, we're at the 70th week of Daniel. All right, that introduces our text. Let's go ahead and get into our lesson. 
Daniel's prophecies are prophecies concerning the last days. They have fulfillment in the last days. The last days began at Pentecost. The uh, Daniel chapter 7 looks at the prophecies that lead up to the arrival of Little Horn. So the vision of the four beasts has as its purpose to prophetically lay out the development of events in what we call the geopolitical world, the alignment of nations and all that, as that will develop to the place where Little Horn shows up. Little Horn is none other than whom? The Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin. So Daniel 7 prophesies the events that will lead up to the arrival of Little Horn. And then Daniel 8 gives us prophecies that give us some background with regard to, the, to where Little Horn comes from. He comes from one of the four kingdoms into which Alexander's empire was divided after he died. But the focal point of Daniel 8 is to tell us that from the time Little Horn arrives to the time he commits what's called the abomination that makes desolate or the transgression of desolation. Those two expressions are used in Daniel. Jesus combined them in Matthew 24, 15. And he refers to it as the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Very, very wise and who's surprised. He took the two times Daniel refers to it, combines the expressions together to tell us that those two things are one event. That's when Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies and declares himself to be God. So Daniel 8 takes us to the middle of the week. And now Daniel 9 is going to take us the rest of the way and take us all the way to the consummation or the time Christ returns. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And there's your review. Who are the first three kings of these first three empires? And go on, because they all come up at once. The Cyrus, yes, and then Alexander, give the man the prize. The prize is, good job. That's the prize. <laughs> but when we come to the fourth kingdom, remember, we, the king isn't named or identified in any way. Alexander wasn't named, but he's identified. So who does the teacher believe is the, is the one that comes in at the beginning of the fourth kingdom and takes the kingdoms under his power? Who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly right. And he establishes his church. And then that puts off the arrival of Little Horn to the end of that time during which Jesus Christ has interposed himself or intervened and, and interjected himself into the world in such a way as to delay the, the rise of Antichrist. So the spirit of Jesus Christ is reigning now in the earth under the Lord Jesus Christ seated on the right hand of the throne of God. Now, Satan, he just decided to pack his bags and go home, right? No. No, he didn't do that. He's put up a big fight. So there's a war going on, isn't there? We are engaged in a great war right now between the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of Antichrist. And as that war proceeds, there's give and take in it as, as in any war. I mean, there are times when the spirit of Christ is advancing against the gates of hell and pushing them back. And then there are times when it appears and actually is true that the gates of hell are prevailing over God's people. Well, what's that about? Why does that happen? I thought it was true that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Surely the spirit of Jesus Christ is greater than the spirit of Antichrist. So why does it so often appear that the spirit of Antichrist has the upper hand in our culture? Well, that's what my book goes into, God's War. And I'm not just passing you off on that. So go buy the book. That's not what I'm going to say next. I'm just going to say, however, that that's coming out real soon. And uh, it goes into that question in great detail and thoroughly explains it. I'll summarize it. Essentially, it's because we blow it. And you just get the bottom line. We are the ones... That, you know, in, in missions, I know uh, Brother Guy probably is familiar with this, the phrase, a critical point of failure or something like that. Or Jim, 
you guys both worked with missiles, right? There's a there's something, the critical point of failure or something. I forget the language now. I messed up. Does anybody remember? Anyway, the point is, you can have a system that's really tight and really good, but you can have one critical point that's the critical point of failure. If that one thing goes wrong, the whole system falls apart. See? And we, we are the critical point of failure in God's program. Because if we don't do what we're supposed to do as kings and priests unto God, then the Antichrist gets the upper hand. We give place to the devil. So please understand that. The devil cannot take any place that we don't give him. And whatever place he has is because we've turned it over to him. So more on that as we go along. But that's the war that's going on right now. When that's completed, Jesus Christ is done. And he takes the church out of the earth. Then the Antichrist will rise to power and will bring this thing to its conclusion. Okay? All righty. And I, I, you know, I don't watch the videos of me very often for all kinds of reasons, mostly the issue of time. But every now and then I do. And when I did, I realized more than ever how much we need to get this chart up here. Because the Facebook audience doesn't see the screens. They don't see all the diagrams. They don't see all the illustrations. And that's a great hindrance to them being able to really follow these lessons. So... Pray with me. There's some expense involved. It's an 8 by 10 I want two of them. And they're about $500 a piece. That's about $1,000. And you know, I, I, asked, uh, I asked my accountant how we're doing there. And she said, probably not this week. Or next, or next, or next, or next, whatever. But anyway, so I mean, we could probably contribute something to it. But we'll need some help with that because it's not in the church budget and it's not in my budget. But I would like to get that up here. I think that would help you as well. You would have to strain your neck trying to watch the screens. Any of that. We'll keep the screens going, by the way. We'll have multimedia thing going on up here. <laughs> Daniel 7 review, remember, begins with the lion and the wings of an eagle. And the lion represents Iraq, modern-day Iraq. And then the wings of the eagle, well, in our day, we would interpret that as being a representation of America getting tangled up with and attached to Iraq. Well, those wings are going to get plucked off, and then that lion's going to stand upright and have a change of heart. The bear's going to rise, have three ribs in its mouth. We think that probably those ribs represent uh, Iran, Russia, and China. There are other alternative explanations for the ribs that are plausible. I think that's the best one. But, well, again, when we, we have another couple of lessons later on where we go into that real detailed stuff. There's a whole set of lessons in this series where we talk about how these prophecies intersect with modern history, okay, with what's going on right now. But that's coming up a little bit later. I'm just preparing you for that through these lessons. Then there's the four-headed leopard, and that represents Alexander's kingdom divided into four separate broken kingdoms coming back together in the last days and forming a kind of confederacy. And then, at that time in history, the fourth beast rises up, and it stomps on everybody else. And it's like being the, uh, the policeman of the world, global police kind of thing. I mean, they're imposing, it's posing its will on all the other nations and stamping them and stomping them. And when we get into explaining how that kind of thing develops, I think you'll be, I think I, think I know you'll be surprised. But it's during the time of this fourth beast that little horn shows up. Little horn shows up. He comes from one of the heads of the third beast. And we think it's the head that would identify Syria and, Lib and uh, Lebanon. Okay. And so he'll come along and he'll take out three horns of the, four, of the ten horned beast. And then when he shoots off his big mouth, he'll be destroyed. Remember those, those kingdoms, the other three remaining will continue but lose their dominion. And this is when we start intersecting with Revelation. So Daniel stops right there. The fourth beast is destroyed. The other three lose their dominion, but they're given a, an extension of their life. That's where Daniel stops. But Revelation picks it up from there and shows us that it's at that time that the scarlet beast comes on the scene. And she, the great whore, represents the Roman Catholic system as it, is to, as it will be in the end. 
I've often, I've said this for many, many, many years, that the Roman Catholic system will probably morph into something weird that'll be a one world religion. I've been saying that since like, like 1970. I think I preached that in the tent revival that we had in commerce in 1973 or 74. So uh, that's coming out of scripture, just insight from scripture. And I believe we're seeing that happen. I mean, recently the Pope got together with one of the premier imams and made a pact between the Catholics and the, and the Islam religion. Wow. Where they agreed that Allah is the same God the Catholics worship. That may well be. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> but anyway, then, then we come to the beginning of the 70th week and uh, we go rolling along. She gets destroyed, the tin horns throw their weight behind little horn. They destroy her, burn her with fire. He then commits the abomination of desolation and then there is raised up on the world scene the ultimate one world system. And a lot of people miss this, but if you pay attention when you're reading Revelation 13, you'll notice that the creature there, the beast, has the body of a leopard, has the mouth of a lion, it has, ten, uh, has a, a seven heads, ten horns, and the feet of a bear. So it combines all of the beasts of Daniel 7 into one creature. So this is the ultimate one world empire or one world government that we've been uh, talking about for a lot of years. Then Jesus comes, whoops them, beats them to chaff, blows them away, sets up his own kingdom. And then we go to Daniel chapter number eight. I'm going to move more quickly here. Uh, what I try to do is select one to slow down and go over it, and then the, and the rest of them fast. And that's kind of a pattern we're doing here. But this is Daniel 8, where the ram shows up with two horns, one horn higher than the other. Uh, that, that represents Persia. Then the goat with one notable horn arrives, destroys Persia. He then is broken. That's Alexander the Great. Four horns come out of his one horn. That's the four kingdoms that come out of the empire of Alexander. And then we have the rise of Little Horn. And the point of Daniel 8 is that from the rise of Little Horn or from the time he begins his career to the time he commits the abomination of desolation, there will be 2,300 days. And we showed that those are 24-hour periods. And we proved that from Scripture. And then we bring it all together, Daniel 7 and 8 together. Okay, there comes the Little Horn. From one of the horns of the four horns, right? One of the four horns of Alexander's kingdom. That begins the 2300 day countdown to abomination of desolation. Okay. Now we're looking at Daniel 9, okay? Daniel 9 tells us that there will be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Seven weeks and then three score and two weeks. And then there's going to be one more week because 62 plus 7 equals 69, and that's not 70. Well, someone said, you know, how do you know that Daniel 9.27 speaks of the 70th week? Well, because we talked about seven weeks and 62 weeks. We got one more week left, and there it is. That's why. Okay, so we, the, the last week is mentioned in verse 27 of Daniel 9, and that's the 70th week. We know the seven weeks develop in three phases. It commences with the decree of Cyrus. It continues with the decree of Darius. And then it concludes with the decree of Artaxerxes. And I gave all the reasons that support that in earlier lessons. We won't do that work right now. So there are the 434 years. So you got 49 years. And then you have 434 years. We got one seven-year period left, one week left, but it gets put off, remember? Jesus intervenes. Satan was ready to go. Okay, ready for seventh, 70th week. Jesus comes, nope, not so fast. Stops him, takes the kingdoms from him, pushes him off. And now a war has commenced between the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of Antichrist in the world. Finally, Jesus will remove his church when he does, then the little horn will arrive on the scene and do his thing, and Jesus Christ will come and destroy him and set up the kingdom. 
And we're looking forward to that. Praise the Lord. Okay. How many of you really feel like you're getting it? How many of you feel like almost? Okay. That's why we review. I mean, we've got to go over and over and over and over again. You know what, what really got me convinced that I have to do the review thing a lot is the fact that I've taught this so many times, and yet I go to some place where I've taught it, and it's like everything I'm saying is new. Because it just takes time for it to kind of sink in and settle in. All right. So Daniel reveals that the 70 weeks prophecy unfolds in two parts. That's the first part, the golden head. And uh, then it goes to the silver, then it goes to the brass, and it goes to the iron, then the feet. But the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 starts when we transition from the gold to the silver. That's where it starts. That happened in 539 B.C. when Cyrus made the decree, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 44, 28 and Isaiah 45, 1 and 2. And that runs till Jesus comes unto Messiah the Prince. And that, he showed up in 5 B.C. All right. <clears throat> so we have the 69 weeks, which run from 539 to 5 B.C., but that last week was put off. Remember, it was delayed. So we have a 70th week that comes in later. The 70th week has a specific beginning, middle, and end. It begins with the confirmation of the covenant. The middle is marked by the abomination of desolation. It concludes with the consummation, the completion, the finale, uh, the, the, the finality, the, <laughs> the finale, <laughs> good night, the finale, Pastor Scheidbach, it's not hard to say, so it starts with the confirmation of the covenant, it proceeds then to the middle of the week, the abomination of desolation, and then it concludes with the finale, <laughs> Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom on the earth. We notice that Daniel reveals the first part or the 69 weeks of this prophecy unfolds in two phases. We showed that 49 years and 434 years. The 49 years began in 539 B.C. The 434 years concludes with Messiah the Prince, or 5 B.C. The 62-week segment begins in 432 B.C. And it concludes with 5 B.C. So in other words, you have the beginning of the 70 weeks prophecy, 539. The seven weeks are fulfilled, the first seven weeks are fulfilled at 432 when Nehemiah declares that he completed, finished, he finished fulfilling the prophecy of the rebuilding of the walls and the streets in troublous times. When Nehemiah fulfilled that, that marked the conclusion of the first segment of that prophecy or the 49 years. That's in 432 B.C. Now that runs all the way to 5 B.C. when Jesus Christ was born, his first coming, all right? And that's a period of 434 years. Daniel reveals that the last week of the 70th week has a very definite beginning, middle, and end, as we already pointed out. But then there's an after. I emphasized that last time. After. And as I pointed out last time, I want to point it out again. After doesn't begin till after. Now sometimes I get silly like that to make the point of how simple it is if you just pay attention to the language. But there are people who say that that prophecy concludes with Christ's death on the cross. Because it says, you know, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And so they conclude, oh, well, the crucifixion, that's the cutting off of Messiah. That concludes the 62 weeks. No. What concludes the 62 weeks is the event that we were already told concludes it. The coming of Messiah, the Prince. That concludes it. The event, this event is something that occurs after. Okay, that's why I'm emphasizing the word after. Let's go ahead and start now. We're going to... We're in Daniel uh, chapter 9, of course, and point 9 on your outline. And now we're breaking into some new stuff that we haven't discussed. Well, we have, but a new layer of discussion on these things, okay? All right. 
Notice that the first 69 weeks conclude with the first coming of Messiah the Prince. Daniel 9.25 We are told that after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. And of course, after means after. The language does not allow us to conclude the cutting off of Messiah is the terminus of the 69 weeks because we're told the cutting off of Messiah, the prince, occurs after the terminus of the 69 weeks. Now that, what that does, when you're reading that passage, if you pay attention to it, it's really very clear. But people read over it too fast. That's what happens. Pay attention. Follow thought to thought to thought to thought. Pay attention. And as you do, I think you'll see it clearly there. The 69 weeks runs from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. And then after the 62 weeks, this event occurs. So it kind of tells you that there's an event that corresponds to the terminus, which is unto Messiah the Prince. And then after that, there's another event that occurs called the cutting off of the Messiah. And yes, that is how closely I read these things. I think it's appropriate to do that. I think Jesus Christ did that when he was using the scripture. He would build an argument for a doctrine so important as the resurrection on the tense of a verb. I think we should take the scripture seriously and read it very carefully and pay very close attention to the language. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, Messiah, cutting off the side of the prince occurs after the conclusion of the first 62 or 69 week run of that prophecy. Then Daniel, <coughs> I'm sorry, 927 tells us the prince that shall come will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, who is this prince that shall come? Well, here it, it gets a little tricky because we just read about unto Messiah the prince. So it is natural that somebody might conclude, well, um, Daniel 927 tells us the prince that shall come is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so that prince that shall come must be the Messiah, the prince. Well, let's begin layering in the problems with that. Because there are a huge number of problems with that. But let's begin layering them in, okay? One of them is the fact that this covenant that he confirms with many for one week will be broken at the middle of that week. So, if Christ is the prince who comes that confirms this covenant being spoken of here for one week, is it the New Testament covenant? And it got broken halfway through? We've already, uh, we will establish more fully, but we've already uh, shown that these, this, these weeks of, these weeks or years, weeks of years. So did the New Testament last Three and a half years, and it was only intended to go seven. There's a lot of problems with this. Say, what covenant is it that Messiah the Prince confirmed on the cross? We know what covenant that was. That was the New Testament covenant. If that's the covenant that's in view here, and it isn't, but if it was, what? That covenant was intended to go for only seven years, but it get in quick, and then it got broken halfway through. In the midst of the week, that covenant was terminated somehow or another, got interfered with. It doesn't make sense. So we're compelled to think, obviously, that, well, that isn't the prince that shall come. So who is this prince that shall come that Daniel's been talking about over and over and over and over again? What is the focal point of Daniel's prophecies? I mean, you can look at Daniel's prophecies and you could say legitimately, oh, his focus is on the ultimate coming of Christ. Yeah, you could say that. But that's not the focal point. That's the climax. That's the conclusion of his prophecies. The centerpiece of this painting is the rise of Little Horn. That's the main thing that Daniel's always concerned about. Daniel never says, oh, well, who is this one that's going to come and destroy all the kingdoms? That's never his concern. His concern is always, who's this guy that's going to show up and destroy the holy and righteous people and commit this abominable act of, called the abomination of desolation? Who's this guy? 
That's where his focus is. So the focus of Daniel's prophecies is always on that prince that shall come. Okay? When he's referring to Messiah, the prince, he differentiated him from this other prince he's been talking about. All right? So, we believe this prince that shall come is not Messiah. What we believe the prophecy says is that at 539, we've got seven weeks, that gets done, 432. 432, 62 weeks gets done, 5 BC, Jesus shows up. After that, certain things happen before the 70th week begins. The 70th week, the 70th week begins with an event called confirmation of the covenant. Well, if it's not Jesus Christ confirming the New Testament covenant, which I think we've shown, there's no way it can be that. What other covenant would Jesus Christ be confirming? And someone says, oh, that would be the Old Testament covenant between God and Israel. Really? Well, what's interesting about that is that covenant was already confirmed. It was confirmed with an oath from God. That covenant was confirmed by God. It goes a little farther than I want to go right now, but we're going to get into this some more a little later. So start getting ready for it by salting in some basic ideas and things to think about. Look, the covenant that God established between himself and Israel is a covenant of agreement in which Israel needs to perform bringing forth the fruit of righteousness unto God and God would bless them and let them dwell in their land and all this kind of stuff. So we people get the idea is this confirmation of the covenant is Israel doing its part or her part. Well, that doesn't work then. That would be Israel confirming the covenant. Not some prince that would come. You see what I mean? It, it's, this is why, a lot of, again, I say, when we're teaching this, usually, we don't bother you with all this stuff. We just go, here it is, here it is, here it is, and run and go. But I decided oh, I'm going to have a whole lot more respect for you than that. We're going to stop and look at this stuff, and I'll explain to you why we come to these conclusions. We're, what's behind all this, these statements that we make? Well, this is, these are the problems we have with this thing. If we say it, it's, it's, you see, God already confirmed a covenant on his part, right? He doesn't need to confirm it again. He's already confirmed it. So the only part of the covenant that would need confirmation would be from Israel to confirm it. But Israel isn't the prince that shall come. <laughs> so what covenant is this? And besides that, there's good argument that would suggest there's no need for Israel to confirm the covenant. God confirmed it by an oath. It's going to be fulfilled, period. Well, it's going to be fulfilled. God's going to fulfill it. It's going to happen. It doesn't require man to confirm it. It was confirmed by God with an oath. And there's no place in the scripture where it calls upon Israel to confirm anything. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's this confirmation of the covenant that we're waiting for it to come from Israel. It's not in the Bible anywhere. So that covenant can't be the one in view here. However, it is the covenant it's a particular covenant, all right? The definite article, the, is there in Hebrew or Aramaic. It's there. In Chaldee, I mean. It's there. Okay, so what covenant would Daniel be talking about? Let's go to the Bible. Let's find a covenant in here. I'm playing around. Let's go to the Scripture Let's dig in, let's search, let's study, let's find, is there a specific covenant mentioned in the Bible that is related somehow to this prophecy? There is. It's in Isaiah chapter 28, beginning at verse 15. In Isaiah 28, beginning at verse 15, there is a specific covenant mentioned. It's a covenant or it's the covenant that Isaiah prophesied the scornful rulers of the Jews would enter into. 
And this covenant that they would enter into was a covenant or is a covenant, will be a covenant, I should say, with death and with hell. They will be in agreement. That's a specific covenant. That's a prophesied covenant. Just like Daniel read Jeremiah, I think Daniel read Isaiah. He also had a little help from the Holy Spirit in giving him revelation concerning these things. I believe the covenant that's spoken of in this prophecy is the one that occurs when Antichrist enters into an agreement with the scornful rulers of Jerusalem. Interestingly, when we start tying Revelation into all this, we have the first four seals of the seven-sealed book opened in Revelation 6. And they are four horses and a horseman developing in four stages, showing a rise to great power. He starts as a white horse, a bow, no arrows, right? And Daniel depicts the beginning career of Little Horn as being a man of peace. Somebody not really much heard of comes on the scene somewhat quietly. Then the next horse is a red horse. The Bible says a great sword is given to the rider. Daniel depicts the rise of Little Horn as proceeding from uh, into the next stage of becoming a great military might. The third horse is a black horse with the scales and so on, and he's measuring out. He's holding the economy now under, under his power. Now he has the, the economy in his power. And Daniel represents Little Horn is rising to power in these same three stages. Using now the might, the, the might he has achieved politically, militarily, and economically, he combines that and the fourth horse rider takes off the mask. He is death with hell following. And he uses the powers he has amassed in the white horse, the red horse, and the black horse. He uses them to destroy one-fourth of the population of the planet. That fourth horse rider is Antichrist. And he represents the development of Little Horn from his beginning now to his zenith of power. And while he's going to take the scourge and go across the earth, killing a fourth of the population of the planet, read Isaiah 28. The reason the scornful rulers of the Jews enter into an agreement with this death is because they want to protect themselves from the overflowing scourge. It all comes together. It comes together beautifully. It's clear to me that this is what happens. We come to the middle of the week. Antichrist started when he took out three of the horns, right? And now he's risen to power. Now he's got amazing spiritual powers. He's death itself, pulling in stars out of the sky, this kind of stuff. I'm getting a little farther into this than I want to right now. He makes, he's, gonna, he's got the power now to, to, to destroy a fourth of the population of the planet, and the Jews see this coming, and the scornful rulers among them raise their hand and say, hey, we're on your side. And so he enters into a seven-year agreement with them. And apparently he has some kind of seven-year plan. But again, those are details we get into later. But he is, enters into a seven-year agreement with them. However, halfway through that week, he has now amassed the power to stand up against the daily sacrifice. And he takes the daily sacrifice away from the Jews and he takes the abomination of desolation and puts it in the holy place. He defiles the temple. And now we're at the middle of the week. And that's when the, the war going on in heaven comes to its crescendo. Michael rises against the dragon and throws him out. He comes to the earth with great wrath, takes up, Oh, I'm getting too deep into that now. You'll have to wait for some. I can't give it all to you right now. Okay, so the person, I, I went ahead and just talked through this stuff. Let's just run by it. Okay, 
So number 10 now. Daniel reveals what takes place during the gap between the conclusion of the 69 weeks and the beginning of the 70th week. First, as we pointed out, Messiah is cut off. That is, he's crucified. Then, the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. I believe that refers to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now we will show a lot of proofs for that. Let me lay a few down now to start thinking about it as we proceed along with this. We know that there's a connection here in this prophecy <clears throat> between the Lord, the, the coming of Messiah, the Prince, and a war he's going to be engaged in against the Prince of the Power of the Air, the Spirit of Antichrist. So they're going to be in this war during this fourth kingdom, during the delay where the 70th week was put off. So that's what's going on right now. We know that Jesus offered to give the kingdom to Israel. We know that he prophesied that she would reject it and that as a consequence, he would remove the offer and give it to another nation, bringing forth its fruit. We know all that from Scripture. <clears throat> we know that Jesus gave a prophecy in Luke 21 concerning the destruction of the temple. They were in the temple talking. As they were leaving, the disciples came to him and said, look at this. Isn't this magnificent? And Jesus said, not one stone you're looking at, not one stone will be left upon the other. Everything you see here is going to be destroyed. They were like, what? What? When's that going to happen? And by what sign will we know that's going to happen? And then Jesus proceeded from there to give them a prophecy concerning his return to the earth. And as he laid out the prophecy, follow the language carefully in Luke 21, and you'll see he runs through the whole thing, you know, wars and rumors of wars and all this is going to happen, and then there'll be signs in the heavens and all this kind of stuff. And then he says, but... Before all these things, something else will happen first. Something will get this prophecy started. <clears throat> Jesus said, there's a prophecy <clears throat> concerning my return. I'll leave to go get a kingdom and I'll give the, uh, the, my goods to you and you will go forth serving me and the citizens in this world are going to hate me. And you know, I've told you enough about this. You can follow what I'm saying right now. That's the prophecy. <clears throat> That's in Luke 19. So he's building on that now. <clears throat> and he's explaining how this is going to proceed. He's telling them, all that's going to happen, just like I told you, I'll be gone, this will be going on, and wars and rumors of wars and this kind of thing, and then there'll come a time when there'll be uh, great signs in the heavens and all that. But, here's what gets all that started. And then he gave them the sign they asked for. By what sign shall we know these things will come to pass? He gave them the sign. When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know the time is nigh. He taught us from that time forward, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Up till then, no. But when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies from that point forward, you look up, your redemption draws nigh. By what sign will we know the kingdom is going to be set up? That's a different sign. That's when you see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. See, that's a different sign. So, Jesus Christ taught them a prophecy. This temple you're looking at is going to be destroyed. How will we know that's going to happen? When you see the city compassed with armies. When did that happen? A.D. 70. Now, you put the epistles together with all this and you start paying attention to what was going on. <clears throat> During that time, Israel, God was still calling out to Israel. He continued calling out to Israel. From Pentecost, they were all Jews. And through that whole period in the book of Acts, God is reaching out to the Jews to come and receive the kingdom. Not the kingdom in which Christ physically will be here reigning, but the kingdom they had before to be restored to their kingdom. 
But they kept refusing and refusing. And so you come to the end of the book of Acts, chapter 28. And Paul says, okay, we're done. He didn't say it that way at all. But basically he said, that's it. Ye stiff-necked, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. We're done. We're going to take it from you. We're going to give it to the Gentiles. That's what Paul said. So he formally declared the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. That the kingdom would be taken from them and given to another nation. And that happened in Acts 28. It just so happens that Acts 28, by most accounts, was written somewhere between 64 and 68 A.D. Very interesting. The event where Paul formally declared the conclusion of the offer to Israel happened within a year or two of A.D. 70 and the destruction of the temple and the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that there would be a time of wrath upon this people that would extend from then on in. And I always have to stop right here and say, you know, wait a minute here, don't get, don't get all anti-Semite on me. <clears throat> the land still belongs to Israel. It's promised to them, according to God. I sure don't want it. Like, let Israel have it. I don't know what the problem is with that. That's, just old, that's that old devil just hating God. And so hating his people kind of thing, you know. <clears throat> but I, I think there, there are plenty of p places for us to live that are every bit as beautiful as Jerusalem ever thought about being. I don't know what they're talking about. I, I got some places in Mississippi I'd rather be in Jerusalem. But I, I'm, just, I'm just making the point that what makes that so passionately interesting because of the fight going on in the spiritual realm. That's why. That's what makes that such a big deal. Otherwise, really, just think it through. How much land do they, do they really have? Can we just relax here? It's not, you know, but what makes it a big deal is Satan and the angels of God warring. That's what makes that everybody's focal point. It's just sad. <clears throat> but the bottom line is, <clears throat> Jesus said that when that temple is destroyed and that happens, city is destroyed, then there will be a period of time called wrath upon this people. Those that jump on that and execute that wrath will come under the judgment of God. You, you need to read your Bible carefully. How many times God did use another nation to chastise his people, but because those people got proud and haughty, he, they don't even exist anymore. They're just gone. <laughs> I mean, Israel's still here, which is a miracle in, its, in and of itself. But some of those nations that have risen up against Israel literally are extinct. They're just not even on the map anymore. And Israel didn't do it. God did it. So it's, you know, we need to be careful about this attitude of, well, Jesus said there'd be wrath upon those people, so I'm going to go help them out. Uh -uh, you better stay out of it. Now, I learned that when I was a kid. My mom spanked my brother Ronald. And I thought he deserved it. And I let her know. And I let him know. You deserve this, buddy. Well, you've heard me tell the story before of Mother's Day, and it's coming up. I probably won't tell that story now. We're giving it, put it, let it out of the bag. But she turned around, and she said, Ronald, you go play. Come here, Jerry. No, she said, come here, Jerry Wayne. She always said, Jerry Wayne, when I was in trouble. She said, this has nothing to do with you until now. And then she spanked me. Uh-huh. She let me have it, which is why I'm the charming personality that I am today. <coughs> Excuse me. But I'm telling you, you don't want to get involved in this thing with God. God will take care of chasing his people. You don't need to get in the stand, in the grandstands, rooting him on. That's a mistake. He'll turn his attention on you in a hurry. And you won't like the results of that. You won't like that attention. So, I want to make sure I'm clear on that. But nevertheless, the Bible did say, Jesus did prophesy this would come to pass. And that is what's happened. How sad it is. It should break our hearts. 
<clears throat> so Daniel then looks beyond the initial destruction of the temple by the people of the prince that shall come to the end thereof. Now, a lot of prophecies do that. I'll show that to you more. I'm coming on the end of my time now. <clears throat> I'll show you how often it is that prophecy, if you read it, the one or two verses, it packs a lot of events in those two verses. And some of those events are separated by great periods of time. One of the most popular examples of this is Isaiah 61. <clears throat> where, where the prophecy is that Jesus would come and it reads on through there and then it, it goes from um, unfortunately I've gotten distracted by my concern about being done on time so that, my brain went into freeze mode let me get over here 61 just read it real quick just this portion I want all right, 61. Here it is. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He shall, or hath sent me to bind up the broken heart and proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. But the prophecy doesn't stop there. The prophecy goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. <clears throat> now the day of vengeance isn't the same thing as the days of wrath. The day of vengeance is one specific day when God pours out his wrath <clears throat> and that comes when Christ returns my point here is that you have a prophecy where it stops in terms of fulfillment there are now over 2,000 years between the word acceptable year of our Lord and the expression the day of vengeance of our God you got phrase acceptable year of our Lord acceptable day of our Lord a semicolon and the day of vengeance of our God, take the day of vengeance of our God, there are 2,000 years between those two phrases. You see what I'm trying to say? Sometimes in these prophecies, you will have great lengths of time between the events that are laid out in the prophecy. And that's just one example. There are several others. And we know that's true because that's what Jesus did. He stopped reading there. And he said, today, this is fulfilled in your ears. But we know that that day, the other part was not fulfilled because he said, I have not come to judge the earth. So he didn't come to do the day of vengeance. He said so. He came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, day of the Lord. Okay. You see, okay. hopefully you begin to see how this works. And so we're done. Let's stand together. We'll pick it up from here next time after our review. <clears throat> We'll discuss a little more about what goes on in the period called after. Father, we're so thankful to you and we do praise you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you, move by your spirit in our midst today. Show yourself mighty on the behalf of all who have a need for you. And that would be all of us. Lord, be glorified and magnified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.